All right, welcome everybody. This is the second talk of our first session of the day, second day of the UGM 2020 for IRODs. Uh, this is Marcin from Aptiv. He's going to talk about uh, data management with the autonomous driving projects he's been working on. Go for it. Okay. All right, start off with the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's it's a pleasure to, to have the ability you know, to talk with you and a pity that we cannot uh, meet directly. Uh, but yeah, still and nothing. So um, I'm going to uh, tell you the, the story of um, the last year uh, and our experience uh, we had within an active HPC team. So uh, we, uh, as a team, are located in, in Krakow, Poland, uh, but the, the company, as an uh, automotive company that maybe some of you uh, heard the name of uh, Delphi Automotive, it's, it's the previous name uh, of, of the company, which was split. And uh, the, the history is that it was a general automotive company with uh, real manufacturing and um, working with many OEMs uh, globally. The vision for the company is to uh, go more to autonomous driving and uh, supported driving, active safety uh, in um, car engineering. Uh, generally, you're seeing a, a photo that was taken uh, some time ago and, and also shared uh, on some bus stops in, in Krakow. Uh, it's, it's part of the team. Um, the one thing that uh, may help you understand uh, our approach uh, in a few uh, places I'm going to talk about is that we are acting as a technical support team uh, for IT, but uh, we are working with uh, hundreds of uh, engineers that are developers uh, themselves. And the, the part we are trying to cover is uh, a shared infrastructure for HPC and data management. So we are responsible for uh, things like bare metal, uh, ride arrays, uh, through operating systems and tools like IROT, SLARM, Blaster file system, BGFS, and also cooperation of some external suppliers. So, so we are trying to, to find that, that the thing that is going to be reusable between a uh, number of, of projects, uh, which have some similarities uh, in general, but also are, are working on their own development uh, in many places. This picture is generally describing our um, data management uh, infrastructure that was uh, deployed in our uh, EMEA uh, location around a year ago. Um, and uh, half of this picture, the, the blue uh, half of this picture is really a, a reason why we started to think about IRODs. So um, previously we were uh, mainly analyzing and or engineers in Aptin from mainly working on the data that was stored internally on our own premise resources. We have a new project where the uh, data volume was growing to tens of petabytes and uh, the need for computing was uh, going up to tens of thousands of cores. We understood that it's not possible to handle everything internally uh, in company, so we needed to engage someone external, uh, cloud server, cloud provider, or someone locally. And uh, finally, we engaged uh, a local, or we built an enterprise agreement with a local university with a nice HPC uh, center and uh, huge resources and the staff that can help us uh, handling this, especially a physical part. But when you're working with a global organization like uh, Global Global Company, like Aptiv, it's very difficult to integrate an external resources with uh, something that is internal um, because of number of uh, reasons, but uh, security being one of, uh, one of those. Uh, so we cannot connect directly to the external resources. The way we introduce IRIS is that IRIS is providing us kind of a data proxy to external resources where we have a network shared between um, the, the supplier and, uh, and our own premise, but we also have an engineers working in an active only uh, network. And when they are requesting resources uh, from internal or external resources, uh, we are just uh, pulling this um, with some automation rules in, uh, in the rule engine uh, and providing from the, uh, from the local caches handled on our end. Um, one of the uh, issues here uh, was that we cannot control, uh, provide access and control on the supplier side because there everything is owned from the POSIX perspective technically by, by only one user. But uh, yeah, thanks to IRIS catalog and uh, the, the split of responsibilities, we are handling an IRIS catalog uh, on the server that has connectivity to our Active Directory LDAP uh, server where we can uh, handle groups permissions, um, login verification of credentials and, and things like that. And uh, then the supplier side is uh, 
just a performance uh, providing thing that doesn't know uh, anything about our users. It is especially important in current times uh, when we have GDPR regulations. So if we even can share uh, access something from the external supplier, then it's difficult to say or it requires additional verification. If we can share uh, user information like name, last name uh, with someone who is external to, to the company. Uh, we also thought that it may be nice to have some automation around, but our decision was not to um, incorporate anything uh, that is automating uh, metadata tagging or, or any actions um, in, internally. We just offer uh, a possibility uh, to our uh, engineering teams, uh, engineering projects that we can um, handle something like a webhook. So we, we can uh, send anything over HTTP to the server that they are building and uh, over a defined API specific for the project. And we also uh, decided that if we will store, uh, that we are not going to store a project specific metadata in, in Iris just to be on the safe side and uh, prevent users from adding tens or, or thousands of uh, of tags to, to files, especially because from, from Iris perspective, uh, we, we cannot, um, we cannot use a data types in a database that can, can help uh, with doing things like uh, geo search or uh, full text search. Uh, it's part of Iris implementation and, and also uh, the, the backend uh, engine Postgres, Postgres used. Uh, so the project can uh, have their own uh, metadata server and the, the only thing from the engineering perspective we are uh, going to store, we can store is, uh, is a unique ID that can help to, to match uh, entries on both sides. Uh, on the other side, we are thinking about um, storing uh, more technical uh, data like a serial number of the hard drive that was used for the data ingest or uh, things like uh, data of ingest, data of replication, um, checksums and, and things like that, obviously. Um, kind of characteristic thing for our deployment is that on both sides, uh, the supplier and internally, we have a Lustre file system, which is a shared file system, a parallel one that can be accessed from multiple servers. And because of that, we went into the direction of a uh, round robin DNS uh, for uh, Iris resource uh, instead of just using uh, a random or previously called round robin uh, resource from Iris perspective, which is something I will uh, explain uh, in a minute. Um, yeah, and we cannot, uh, we, we have to provide a POSIX interface as well, just because HPC and the data analysis uh, done on, on the things we are handling internally is one of the most crucial things uh, in product uh, lifetime. Um, okay. Um, What's, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so just, just briefly uh, about, about the picture. So you see uh, green uh, resources, as I mentioned, that's it's our internal uh, company network. Uh, we are connecting from the internal network to the AWS uh, S3 and using this uh, for replication uh, locally on those uh, six uh, servers. Uh, uh, here we have um, the round robin DNS uh, resource uh, connected to the to the Luster file system over Infinibent network. Uh, we're also having an ingest stations uh, locally. Uh, from ingest stations, we have the possibility to connect directly to the supplier uh, resources. Uh, so if we are ingesting, uh, we are we are going directly. But if we have a, a user from the um, our active network, uh, we are going through uh, our proxies caches if needed. Uh, our users are relying on a cyber duck. Uh, we try to use um, Iris commands uh, on the Linux subsystem, subsystem on Windows 10 because the, the company is uh, bound to Microsoft and, uh, and desktops of users are, uh, are Microsoft uh, Windows 10. Uh, it didn't work probably because of some uh, limitations uh, coming from the company policies applied to, to workstations. Um, how this works is uh, that uh, the user when connecting, uh, it's always connecting to the Iris catalog and the Iris catalog uh, does, depending on the resource where the file exists, if it's local, it just redirects it into the local resources. If uh, the, the file or the data uh, exists uh, in the external resources, it's triggering replication from uh, another round robin DNS uh, resource to uh, local uh, drives of, of those six servers uh, where it's stored uh, as a cache. Uh, and then from, from this cache, uh, it's uh, triggering a tra transfer to the, to the end user. Um, we wanted to do uh, 
not only because of the limitation of the network speed, but also to, to avoid uh, users uh, getting uh, slow reads from the high performance file systems. It's kind of important for us because between those two sides, we have 100 gig connection. So replication of a data set like four or five gigabytes, uh, it's pretty nothing. But if we have a slow computer connecting, a uh, potential engineer connecting over Wi-Fi, it may take minutes to transfer those files. So we prefer this to be happening between the, the buffering server instead of the uh, direct connection from the HPC, HPC resource uh, on the supplier end. Uh, we uh, have not only those uh, resources servers, but currently we also have an ingest stations there uh, as another possibility. And this is, um, that was needed just because the, the throughput of the data uh, increasing projects. We're also having a, a dedicated um, farm of servers that are uh, providing additional uh, access and analysis all over the hardware uh, in the loop uh, devices there, uh, which is uh, from the IRS perspective is just a, another POSIX uh, file system uh, client, so it's completely IRS unaware. Uh, but uh, because of that, we're thinking about some of the registration features uh, from Lasser and yeah will be covered in the next slides. Okay, let's, let's move on. Um, okay, as I promised, uh, a quick description of uh, what we are doing with this uh, round robin DNS. So um, we have a number of servers, nine at the supplier side and six uh, on our on-premise resources. Uh, let's focus on those uh, six green uh, servers on the picture. Um, our goal was to achieve really high uh, throughput replication between supplier uh, and uh, on-premise uh, site. Uh, this wasn't possible with the use of uh, only one server. Uh, the replication was by its nature happening between two shared file systems. So that if we will just go with the traditional uh, round robin resource in IROTS, then the file will be um, registered as being available on a specific server. And when the server is frozen down, the, the read cannot happen. If the, uh, by any chance the, the files are registered as being on a specific server, all the reads are going to be handled by this specific server. And addition of another um, to this uh, group will not help with that because from the perspective of, of IRS, this is just a, just a local storage. And since on our end, it's just a network file system, everything is available everywhere. So instead of uh, doing that, we just did a, a traditional uh, Unix file system resource uh, available, uh, configured on each server. And then we are also having a, a DNS name pointing uh, to all those servers uh, with an internal DNS uh, server returning only one of uh, the entries on a random manner. Um, it was kind of fun uh, for me when I tried to, to work with that. Uh, everything was going to only one, the first resource, and then I discovered this mentioned on the slide RFC 4384, which is a specification on how the um, randomly returned DNS entries, uh, simply address A records, are sorted on the client side, which got implemented in the glibc 217. That is a standard for CentOS 7, uh, Red Hat 7. Um, so in a local area network, simply uh, the random, um, random order of records was uh, just sorted on the client side and we just implemented as our own Python uh, DNS uh, server that returns only one resource per request. Um, and yeah, thanks to that, we also have the possibility of kind of a health check implementation, which is already done uh, in our DNS server. So if the, the, the Python uh, daemon recognizes that the service, service is down with a specific check. It just removes it from the pool. So uh, it's actively uh, doing uh, active, active, uh, high availability uh, resource. From the single session communication, um, it's, I try to explain it, but it's very uh, well explained on, on this picture. Uh, our client is going always to the IRS catalog and uh, here's where all the magic has to happen. So from the client perspective, we, we don't have the, uh, the, the round robin DNS uh, domain at all, um, but on the IRS catalog server, technically speaking, we have a DNS mask uh, a daemon that is um, forwarding all the queries to all domains to the company DNS server, but uh, the round robin uh, domain, uh, pseudo domain is, is handled internally 
uh, and then for this for those uh, recurs we are just returning a specific server like asking for this uh, round robin service we are answering with one of those from from zero one to zero six uh, when an iris catalog gets it it's uh, also potentially asking for the another re dns resource this is round robin one uh, on the supplier side when it gets it, it's downloading something from the external resource, putting it onto the buffer, and then returning uh, the redirecting the, the client to uh, to the locally uh, available resource, and then um, everything is is handled uh, with simply client being kind of aware of of all the complicated uh, things happening uh, behind the scene. Um, yeah, and here uh, an explanation of uh, of the cache being the, uh, on the locally available uh, server on the SSC drive. Um, okay, one of the things we are working on actively as a uh, working progress part, um, it's, it's a connection with uh, automatic registration on the Luster and EGFS, which is our choice for our uh, second uh, location, our North America resources. Um, we are working on that. We've noticed uh, some uh, issues and, and the risk. That the main risk that was stopping us for quite a long time is that if the, the, the fact that we believe that it may happen that we will be registering files too slow because it doesn't look like we have a possibility to perform something like a bulk register uh, from the uh, Lustre plugin. And uh, slow read of the Luster uh, log may result in uh, simply Luster file system being um, unavailable uh, just because it cannot perform an operation if it uh, cannot uh, log it to the to the register. So it's kind of risk. Um, I personally like uh, zero MQ approach uh, editor, but it's uh, still uh, not a not a very standard uh, thing, and um, because we are. We are in industry, uh, so we uh, always have to uh, do kind of a threshold between stability and, and the nice features. As mentioned in the first point, currently we're just using a workaround where the user uh, can call uh, a, a wrapper script that calls over pseudo IREG, and then they're just uh, saying that they expect some file to exist. So if they know that they're submitting a, a job that should generate some files, they are just calling this script, and if something really exists, uh, then it gets registered and then it's, it's available to, to users. Not perfect, but works and it's stable uh, for now. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, something we uh, we want to at least try and, and implement. Uh, we did an approach to um, uh, with, with an uh, audit uh, row engine. Um, Unfortunately, uh, we've noticed uh, this impacting availability of, of IRS for our end users. It happened to us that we had, you know, obviously it wasn't uh, an optimal deployment with only one uh, RabbitMQ uh, server, but when it uh, went down, uh, or it went down because the um, space for uh, for messages was, was just full, the, the file system was full there, and this is an action of RabbitMQ service to go down in this case. Uh, we've noticed that uh, this impacted availability, and probably it was just because the huge number of connections uh, going to immediately to a disconnected and uh, time wait states on our resources. And um, it will be nice to uh, to have a, a sets of templates like a configuration of what rules should be logged and what can we achieve uh, with that. And uh, I think I personally uh, found it difficult uh, was kind of a need for a reverse engineering of, of the meaning of uh, specific uh, JSON uh, attributes uh, attributes in, in the JSON sent from, from the rule engine uh, finally to, to log such and, and our Kibana. So yeah, a lot of uh, improvements that may happen on the documentation side of, of that project. Um, okay. I. The, the last thing about uh, audit is something that we will probably try to, to re-enable it, but we are really, really busy these days. Um, one thing that you may notice on the first uh, picture of our infrastructure was the connectivity to S3. And um, this is also uh, a little bit complicated just because of the contract requirements with uh, other partners in, in our projects. 
uh, we are obliged to send it from our local servers. So um, we have a direct connect line connected uh, to our on-premise resources, but sometimes we are uh, similarly for our internal clients pulling something from the supplier and done, then just uh, putting it to, into S3. Uh, we've noticed that um, achieving of high throughput, uh, there is only possible with when we are using really a uh, number of connections at a time, uh, because only this way we are achieving a uh, number of connections to different IP addresses behind S3. And this means that we have to handle a uh, huge number of open uh, file descriptors on our ICAT. It's also because of the, the setup of the automated replication uh, from, from the ICAT and uh, the connections happening to, to, to both uh, IRIS uh, resources on our end. We're, Thinking about some improvement may happen. We already discussed, and also previous talks we'll discuss with with uh, our friends from uh, from our support. Uh, so, yeah, we also noticed this uh, error that was strange for us for uh, some time. But uh, as as I know, it was uh, added to the to the readme of the project that uh, the S three D twelve false name is. It's mandatory uh, with uh, the, the bucket region uh, being inside there. Uh, the, the funny thing was that uh, we've been receiving an internal S3 authentication errors and this was kind of going away after a day. So after a few hours of debugging and then decision that, okay, we will be back with this issue tomorrow morning. Uh, on the morning, we've been noticing that everything works fine now. Um, the maximum throughput we, we achieved to, to the S3 was uh, around uh, 20 gigabits uh, per second. That's one of the uh, last uh, results we, we had from, from the previous two, two weeks. Okay, going closer to the end of the presentation, I'm uh, just mentioning a few small issues that we noticed working with fire. So it's like some of the user tools all are not uh, very natural, like uh, IMV. Uh, it, it would be nice if it can work more like a standard standard MV. So it's it's a rename when uh, called for the same file system, but if it's called for the different resources, for instance, with a specification of the uh, destination resource, um, making it internally being a replication in Trim uh, will be nice. It it was very confusing for for one of our users. Uh, in as you know from the presentation uh, we are relying on the redirect a lot uh, so we don't want uh, the transfers to happen directly from the ipad and currently there is no way to kind of trigger it from the from the row engine internally or just no way i i am aware of i mean the direct way just just telling this has to be uh, redirected so we are either uh, using minus n2 or we are uh, shrinking um, file uh, a file size that uh, can be transferred uh, over the uh, iOS catalog. It will be nice if this can be something done in uh, side row engine. Um, I I know that technically it's not it's not that easy and it's not possible at, at every stage, but yeah, something that can be uh, considered for a future improvement. Um, we've noticed uh, an issue with user generating uh, huge queries uh, like of this case, someone wants to list the old files on the file system he has available just to put it into his um, spreadsheet and then use it as the best tool for um, big data analysis. Uh, I don't know any good solution for that. Maybe maybe someone can, can advise if it's possible to have a um, simple query verification in a row engine that will just reply that your message is generating too big size, or if uh, we are generating something that doesn't uh, provide an answer from the database, maybe we can time out and send a nice error message to, to the user telling him that, okay, this was probably wrong. Uh, we just uh, stopped processing of, of your request. Uh, it's especially about things like listing, like uh, metadata, uh, tag gathering. Uh, and we are seeing a lot of errors like the one mentioned, uh, which is something we still don't know <laughs> what to do. Uh, my current guess is that it's, it's related to some users using a Python client with a uh, pluggable addiction uh, modules, uh, which is probably still not uh, released, but they just got it from, uh, from GitHub. And finally, um, the, the, the very main point that uh, 
we decided to go with finance after verification of a number of uh, projects just more than a year ago. Uh, the flexibility and kind of project uh, with, a, with a major major pro the being a major enough to, to be used uh, was was the deciding for deciding factor. Uh, but even when we decided to to go into iOS, we were aware that some error messages will be very confusing. Uh, and I have this uh, great example. In our case, it sometimes happened that the list of the remote addresses uh, should contain even free addresses. Um, in this case, we are receiving the information that the, that the host may be down. And as you see, this is one of those round robin uh, resources. And the, let's say a junior iOS administrator will probably go to those two remote servers to look for some uh, error messages. But when you go into the code, it's kind of easy to understand that those two were just fine. And this is the, the third, and we honestly don't know. It's part of our deployment. We don't know what is the, the host name because we are using the, the round robin DNS name here. So we don't know what was returned from the DNS uh, server and we don't know where we failed to connect. Uh, educating users, it's a challenge for us. Um, it's coming from a few things. Uh, we, we tried to deploy the web interfaces like uh, Linux, but basically because, uh, or the main thing uh, for me is that we, we don't have a pluggable mechanism to use a different transfer methods internally in app if we're using or to our to connect to our APC resources with the whole data sets we're using Aspera for external access if we can somehow connect uh, Aspera with uh, a web interface for iOS that would be uh, really great but just using HTTP upload and, and get can't can't work with the uh, size of the data sets uh, we, we are using so and I know it's it's not a goal of Mitel and X, but just uh, mentioning a difficulty here. Using a cyber doc was kind of a, a relief for us. Uh, it, it helped us uh, working, but it also has some limitations with uh, parallel transfers being uh, triggered uh, separately um, and with the number of files being transferred at the time. Yep, and all those are summing up into the the endpoint that those are probably difficulties of the Windows centric organization, uh, which we are seeing, and uh, we are having those not only with iOS but also with other uh, HPC tools we we used to uh, suggest to to our users and provide to them. That's that's pretty much all. Thank you for listening, and yeah, I'll appreciate any questions and, and suggestions as well. Oh, very good, thank you. Uh, there are a couple questions. Um, uh, Mike, well, this is more of a more of a comment. Uh, Mike Conway from NIEHS was the original developer of uh, iDrop, which was a client-side, uh, parallel-capable uh, client, and so he's bringing that back soon. So that may be an alternative soon for you instead of CyberDuck. CyberDuck is limited to the streaming interface uh, per the CyberDuck policies. They just didn't want to build a different protocol. So uh, just that's coming. And I think Mike might talk about it uh, uh, later this week. Uh, in terms of different transports, I think we do have plans for pulling that out. I think yesterday's talk that, uh, that Corey spoke about um, our work with the IROD's internal libraries and DStream, uh, shortly we'll be able to support different things like potentially RDMA or Aspera or something like that as well, uh, which might fit nicely with the things you're trying to do. Um, did, have you tried, uh, I noticed that you said the audit was overwhelming the, um, you know, it filled up the disk. Uh, by default, the, the audit plugin is configured to, you know, star asterisk, so it, all of the peps show up. Uh, so you could definitely limit that and it would reduce uh, the load on that machine or that system. Yeah. It's, uh, but you have to know what you want. <laughs> it, it, it was kind of a, you know, um, one block falling on the other uh, case. So our yeah. our lock stash failed, and this was the reason for the RabbitMQ uh, disk uh, getting to be full. And when it went full, Rabbit go, went down. And because it went down, we noticed timeouts on the IRS resources servers. And those timeouts were really overwhelming uh, the yeah. infrastructure. So uh, one last question from uh, Pete. Uh, let's see, do your HILs process data automatically or is it a manual process? And are the HIL results saved in metadata or an external database? 
uh, HI, uh, high availability. I, uh, HIL was, I think, on one of your slides. That's what he did. Oh, okay. Those, okay. So, uh, this, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> hovering the loop. We are not uh, storing any project specific metadata in IROS database. Okay. So, it was kind of a decision done because we, as, as a team, as a team being uh, a support team for multiple projects, we don't don't want to uh, you know spend any time developing something dedicated. It happens sure. because of the kind kind of major projects uh, still, but yeah. And then one last question, uh, Jason Kaposki, uh, here's your ingest uh, troubles. He says, have you tried the automated ingest capability on the ingest nodes at the edge, setting up landing zones? Uh, that would potentially allow you not to have to move from, you know cyberduck style things you know you could oh. have drop areas that could be watched rather than be actively pushed we we thought about that uh but honestly our ingest stations are just uh, linux boxes where uh, we have some scripts automatically mounting uh drives and uh triggering iput uh and then uh cyberduck the cyberduck is just used by engineers um, mm -hmm. in company office or over vpn these days probably uh where they are not really uh, doing a bulk analysis of a uh, huge amount of data, but in cases where they know that there is a specific uh, file where uh, there are rare conditions registered, they need to download it and work on it locally. So this right. is where we use CyberDuck. Right. Uh, not, I don't know if you're familiar with the NFS rods efforts as well. That might be another way to allow, you know, humans access into a namespace. Uh, yeah. If, if we will have something like uh, SIPs rods, then it would be great because of the Windows centric company. Right, uh, right. NFS, yeah, I know it's supported in Windows 10, but there, there are some issues with providing mapping and... Sure. Just to tell you, internally in our company, we have like four uh, Active Directory domains right now. So technically this is challenging uh, <laughs> to, to use. An, an understatement, yes. <laughs> Very good. I think uh, that is about it from everybody. I will thank you, Marcin, appreciate it. And uh, of thank course, uh, conversation can continue in Slack uh, for the rest of the week if you want. Thank you.